indeed, what joy that Christ, our King, is born. Uh, we're going to be thinking more about the meaning of his birth now and how we should respond to him. We'll be looking at Matthew chapter 2. Uh, you can look at the outline if you want to take any notes. Uh, there will be discussion questions uh, you can look at later over Christmas lunch if you wanted to. Let me lead us in prayer and we'll think about uh, how we ought to respond to Christmas. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you for the joy of Christmas as we remember the birth of Christ as our Savior and King. And uh, now as we come to your word, help me to preach it faithfully. May your spirit work in our hearts. Enable us to recognize the majesty of King Jesus. Enable us to worship and adore him as the Lord of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it always intrigues me at Christmas time how many Christmas carols are played all over Malaysia. I mean, it is a majority Muslim country. Uh, at, at many times, the Christian voice is silenced in our nation. Uh, yes, there'll be certain shops that might try and stop you from writing Merry Christmas on your, on your Christmas cake. Uh, but largely, uh, at Christmas time, whether it's shopping centers or restaurants or even on television, the message of Christmas is proclaimed loud and clear through all the Christmas carols uh, that are played in the background. Uh, just consider with me the words of, O come all ye faithful, O come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem, come and behold him, born the king of angels, O come let us adore him, O come let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Those words will ring uh, through the shopping malls and everywhere around us. It is a wonderful Christmas carol, isn't it? Uh, it has awe-inspiring claims. It demands a radical response. Christ the King has been born. We must obey, uh, we must adore him with joy as the Lord of our life. But of course, the, the, the sad news is that even as these this glorious, life-transforming message is played all around the country to the masses. It is largely ignored. Uh, we're so busy with the Christmas shopping and eating our food that we don't even listen to the life-transforming message being played in the background. And there is a danger that you and I can fall into the same trap even today to go through all the celebrations of Christmas, the presents, the Christmas trees, uh, the lovely decorations, the carols, the family, uh, the food, and all of that, but we walk away from Christmas unchanged. No awe, no gratitude, no repentance, no worship of the Lord Jesus. But as that uh, carol, O Come All Ye Faithful, so powerfully ex uh, explains to us, Christmas does demand a response from us, a response of nothing less than total wholehearted worship of Jesus. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Well, who is the baby in the manger? Uh, Matthew began his gospel, remember, giving us the human origins of Jesus, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. We've seen that Jesus is the son of Abraham. He's the long-promised descendant who would bring blessing to all the nations of the world. We've seen that Jesus is the son of David. He was God's royal king, the one promised who would sit on David's throne and rule over the whole world forever. And we've seen that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one who would end the exile and usher in an age of salvation and forgiveness for all who would turn to him. And yesterday in Christmas Eve service, we saw also the divine origins of Jesus. We saw that he is the divine saviour, conceived by the Holy Spirit, fully God and fully man. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 21, we thought about his name, Jesus he will be called Jesus, which means God saves, because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus has come in the flesh. He's God in the flesh who has come to rescue us from our sins. And in chapter 1, verse 23, he is called Emmanuel, God with us. So here is the wonder of the Christmas message. The baby in the manger was God himself. 
the all-powerful creator of the universe, lies there helpless in the manger. The one who upholds the universe lies held in his mother's arms. The life giver is given life by his mother. The baby, fully God and fully man, arrives to save us. If we have grasped those truths, then Matthew wants us to see in his gospel the right response to Jesus. That is total undivided worship. He wants us to adore him as the supreme king of the nations. He wants us to submit our lives to him. Well, let's uh, begin this morning. The first point, the nations seek their true king. The nations seek their true king. Look with me at verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose. We have come to worship him. Now, before we go any further, we need to correct a few things about the wise men. First, notice there's a footnote in verse 1. They're not actually wise men, but they're literally magi, right? They were Middle Eastern astrologers or magicians, probably, possibly from Babylon or Persia, like the ones you read of in the book of Daniel. Secondly, in verse 8, they do not meet a baby. They meet a child, if you look very closely. Verse 11, they don't find him in a manger. Where do they find him? They find him in a house, right? And in verse 11, there are three gifts, aren't they? Gold, frankincense, myrrh. But it, nowhere does it say that there was only three wise men. There may have been more or less. I mean, presumably at least two if it's plural, yeah? So they come sometime after Jesus' birth. They come from a foreign land and he, the main point is this. Here we see the nations, the far-off nations, coming to worship Israel's king. See, they're not seeking King Herod, are they, who was literally the king of the Jews at that time. They're searching for another king. They're searching for the long-awaited Messiah. They are searching for Jesus. Because right at the beginning, God created the world. He made humanity to be in his image, to be his special people in relationship with him. But Adam and Eve sinned. They fell from, uh, from how God intended. They rebelled against him and the world was cursed. And after the fall, God promised in Genesis 12 to reverse the curse of the fall. He made those wonderful promises to Abraham to bring blessing to all the nations once again. And as the Old Testament progresses, that hope of blessing for the world, it becomes focused on a king of Israel, someone who would establish the kingdom of God, who would bring all the nations back under the rule of God and would bring his blessing to them once more. And so as we see these magi coming to worship Jesus, we see all those ancient promises coming to fulfillment. That's what the star is about, actually. It's not just that these are kind of stargazers who are, you know, following the star to find Jesus supernaturally. The rising star is actually a fulfillment of a key Old Testament prophecy about God's promised king. Look with me at Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. It says this, a star shall come out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. So God had promised that a king would arise out of Israel who would destroy all the enemies of God, who would rule forever. The star identifies that the long-awaited king has finally arrived. Now, there are many places in the Bible, in the Old Testament, we could talk about the coming of this king. Uh, but here is a few. In verses 3 to 6, we see how Jesus fulfills a prophecy from Micah about where God's king would be born. Because the prophet Micah had promised many years earlier, God's promised king would be born in Bethlehem. Look at verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. 
And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. So Judah was the royal tribe from where all the kings of Israel came, and Bethlehem was the birthplace of the great king David. It, it was a lowly place to be born. There was not much there. But Jesus, born of the tribe of David, of David uh, Judah, in the city of David, Bethlehem, just as Micah prophesied, it says, look, here is the king. Here is the one who would come and rule God's kingdom. And he, he would not only be the king, but he would be the king who would save his people and would bring them peace. So this is what Micah writes. He shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. They shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Is the king that comes to bring peace, to destroy the enemies of God, to bring restored relationship. Now, it's not just Micah 5, though, that is being fulfilled here too, because the Old Testament is full of so many prophecies about the king. 2 Samuel 7 spoke of a king, an eternal ruler who would sit on David's throne forever. Psalm 2 spoke of a king who would rule over all of the nations and, and judge those who rebelled. Isaiah chapter 9, which we looked at yesterday, spoke of a divine king born as a child who will rule in righteousness and peace forever. We're meant to see with the birth of Jesus, all of these prophecies are fulfilled. Jesus comes as king to rule over the nations in a kingdom of righteousness and peace. He comes to bring blessing to all the world. Now, there is one more prophecy in particular that is fulfilled by the wise men, and it's from the Old Testament reading we looked at in Isaiah chapter 60. Let's look again at that passage. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Thick dar uh, behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you. His glory shall be seen upon you, and nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. It's a prophecy that, that one day God would come to shine light on our world. He, he would banish the darkness of death. He would bring salvation for his people. He would restore blessing to the nations. He would reign it forever over every nation, every race, every culture, every person in every place. And on that day, as the Magi come from afar, to worship King Jesus, well, this prophecy is fulfilled as well. The child they come to worship is Emmanuel, God come to save. And, and so at Christmas, we remember the king of the Jews is also the king of the nations. He is our king. He is the one who demands our allegiance. He demands that we come and adore him and offer him our worship and our allegiance, just like those wise men so long ago. So how will we respond to King Jesus this morning? Well, before we're shown the right response, Matthew wants us to see the wrong response to Jesus. We're at the second point, wicked rejection. The wrong response, wicked rejection. It's Herod's response in verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Herod, Herod is troubled because Herod is king, and therefore if there's a new king, it's a threat to his own personal rule. But we're also told that the people are also troubled too. Why are they worried? Are they worried about Herod's response? Do they not want a new king to rule over them? Perhaps it's the, the faintest of hints as to where the gospel of Matthew is going to end with the people rejecting Jesus, handing him over to Pilate and to Herod to crucify him. But Herod's response is exactly what you would expect from an evil king. Verse 4, assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. He, he finds out from the from that prophecy in Micah, he's going to be born in Bethlehem, in Judea. And then verse 7, what does he do? 
Herod summoned the wise men secretly. He ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. He speaks nothing but deceitful lies. He gathers them in secret because he has a secret plot. He intends not to worship the new king, but to kill him. And there, friends, is an insight into the human heart. God steps into our world in the person of Jesus to save us, to establish a perfect kingdom, to rescue us from death, to bring us righteousness and peace. And how do people respond? They don't want him to be king. They will go to extraordinary lengths to reject him. Herod will even resort to killing babies. That's exactly what Herod does. Uh, being in verse 12, being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. And Herod, when he realizes that he has been tricked, turns on the innocent children. In an act of cruel infanticide, he decides he's going to slaughter all of the babies born in Bethlehem. Look at verse 16. Herod, when he saw he'd been tricked by the wise men, became furious. He sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old in and under according to the time he had ascertained from the wise men. So the natural human response is to reject the kingship of Jesus, whether it's the religious person who rejects him for another religion, or whether it's the free thinker who would rather live for their own passions and desires. It's no accident in Matthew's gospel that the next time Jesus is called the king of the Jews is at his trial. Hail, king of the Jews! the soldiers cry as they beat him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews, reads the sign above his head as he hangs on the cross. You see, in our hour of darkness, instead of worshipping King Jesus, we put him to death. And yet, of course, all this is God's plan. It, Jesus' name means God saves. He, he came to die in our place. He came to rescue us from our sins. He came to take that punishment we deserve for our rebellion. He came to rescue us from that judgment. So let me ask, how will you respond to Jesus this morning? If you are investigating the Christian faith, maybe you've come with your family members who hope you will know something more about Jesus today. Thank you for being here. Will you recognize the baby in the manger is in fact the God of the universe, the one who claims the rule of your life. Please can I urge you this morning, do not reject King Jesus. Do not think life will be better without him. Don't let your heart be darkened like Herod. Jesus' rule is good. Jesus is the king who goes to the cross. Jesus is the king who came to rescue you and bring you into a kingdom of righteousness and peace. He is so good. He is so loving. He is the sovereign who serves. He is the ruler who rescues. And submitting to his rule is perfect joy. It is perfect freedom, perfect delight. Please don't reject him like Herod well, instead, Matthew shows us the right response he hopes from each of us this morning, that of wholehearted worship. The third point, the right response, wholehearted worship. And again, Matthew presents these magi to us as a kind of model uh, for us to follow. You know, no distance too great, no treasure too lavish. They come from afar seeking Jesus to worship him with joy. Look at verse 9. After listening to the king, they went on their way. Behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly 
with great joy. And boy, were they right to be so happy that day. The promised Savior King, promised for millennia beforehand, had finally arrived. As Christians, we've got so much to be joyful about today, don't we? Yes, our world is in a total mess everywhere you look. There are wars, there's sicknesses, there's fighting, and, and so many problems all around us. And maybe it's quite close to home for you right now. Our world is messed up. We suffered at the hands of a pandemic. We suffer in so many other ways too. We live in a fallen world, a world cursed by sin, a world of suffering and sickness and division and death. Yes, that is our world. But Jesus came to bring a perfect kingdom where there is no more disease, where there is no more division, where there is no more darkness, disability or death. He came to bring a kingdom of hope, life peace. And so Jesus would grow up. He would live the obedient life none of us have lived. He gives a glimpse of his kingdom as he heals the sick and raises the dead and drives out demons and, and, and shows his complete control over creation, calming the storm. And then King Jesus dies on the cross as our king, taking the punishment that we deserve so that he might save us Make us his children. Give us the hope of eternal life. What exceeding joy it is to know the Lord Jesus. What exceeding joy to have peace with God, to have the hope of eternal life absolutely assured, to know that you are loved by God and chosen by God to serve him with joy. What a delight. What exceeding joy. Joy. That's the response we are to have to Jesus. But of course, not only do the wise men rejoice, they gladly submit to him as their king. Verse 11, going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense. And myrrh. I mean, what amazing sight that must have been these uh, these wise men clearly they must be quite wealthy to have these gifts and here they are prostrated before a little child it's a sign of their complete and utter submission to Jesus as the king of kings uh, they offer him treasures of immeasurable value gold frankincense and myrrh they are treasures that were fit for a king uh, it's like the man who has met the girl of his dreams and so sparing no, no expense, he saves up for a very long time and buys a beautiful diamond ring, precious without measure of a sign of his commitment and his love. Jesus is supremely worthy of our joyful worship. And, of course, this too is a fulfillment of the Old Testament as well. This is not the first time that people come from the east, far off, bringing their treasures to the king of the Jews. It's exactly what the Queen of Sheba did when she came to visit King Solomon a thousand years earlier. She came from the east, bringing her treasures to the king of the Jews. Look at 1 Kings chapter 10. When the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She came from Jerusalem with a very great retinue with camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones. They're the same gifts, do you see? Verse 10, she gave the king 120 talents of gold, which is a lot, and a very great quantity of spices and precious stones. Never again came such an abundance of spices as these the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. And the rest of the Old Testament celebrates that great event uh, at the high point of Israel's history. Psalm 72 says this, May the kings of Tarshish and the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. May all nations serve him. Verse 15, long may he live, may gold of Sheba be given to him. And especially in that Old Testament reading, Isaiah chapter 60, 
Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult because the abundance of the sheaths shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nation shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba, shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and bring good news, the praises of the Lord. So as these wise men come from the east, sparing no expense with these expensive gifts of gold and frankincense and so on for King Jesus, we realize that Jesus is a far greater king even than King Solomon was. This is the King of Kings. This is the Lord of Lords who deserves our worship, who deserves our total, wholehearted, joyful submission to him. See, that's the right response to Christmas, to bow the knee before him, to say to Jesus, you are my king, to offer him our very lives, to joyfully submit to him. See, it's not just meant to be a, you know, come to church on uh, Christmas Day, thing, tick the box, come back, see you again at Easter. No. <laughs> not just, well, serve him on Sunday, but uh, the rest of the week, well, never mind. No. It's not it's not just one area of life. It's, it's, it's every area of life in our work, in our family, with our time, with our money, with our ambitions and dreams, with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. We are to worship King Jesus. So have you done that? Have you come to Jesus in total, wholehearted worship as the king of your life? Have you said to Jesus, look, here is my life. Use my life for your glory. That's the right response to Christmas. Now, part of that life of worship for the glory of Jesus is to give your life to his mission, to the nations, calling others to worship him as you have done yourself. It's so interesting how Matthew deliberately begins and ends his gospel with the nations coming to the Lord Jesus. He begins here, chapter 2, with the Magi coming from afar to worship King Jesus. And he ends in chapter 28 with the risen Lord Jesus worshipped by his disciples and then sending them out to the world. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. He begins... And he ends with the nations coming in. At the start, they come in. And at the end, the people are sent out to gather the nations in to the kingdom. So how will you respond to Christmas this morning? Will you seek him like the wise men? Will you joyfully celebrate his birth? Will you bow down before him in worship? Will you go out to gather in the nations that they may worship him too. Well, there is a danger that you and I can uh, go through Christmas but walk away unchanged and sing the carols. We can read the story, but no awe, no gratitude, no adoration, no worship. Don't let that happen to you and your family this Christmas. Don't just come here, let the message wash over, and then off it goes. Will you worship Jesus this morning? Will you kneel before him, hand over to him your career, hand over to him your family, hand over to him your ambitions and dreams, hand over to him everything, heart, soul, mind, strength? Will you resolve? to live your life for his glory as you proclaim him among the nations. Because we have met Emmanuel. We've met God with us. We have met Jesus, the one who has come to save us from our sins. He is our shepherd. He is our ruler. He is our peace. He is worthy of our joy, our worship, our service, and our proclamation. Let's read, read again from that lovely carol. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. 
Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for reminding us that Jesus is indeed the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Lord, help us to give him our total, wholehearted worship. Help us, Lord, not to walk away from Christmas unchanged, but use our lives this year for his glory as we love him and obey him and proclaim him to the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.